And what I'm going to talk about here is some of the problems that users tend to face managing their password technologies and looking at some of the options that, that can potentially take us beyond this. So I think it's fair to say that password security is something that all of us and indeed many users out there will be completely familiar with in terms of having to use them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's something that pretty much everybody online has got multiple passwords for the different accounts that they're using. Um, and if you ask the end user community in general, do you like passwords, can you get on with using them, we find that the response tends to be yes, okay, they, they seem quite happy with them. And you look at surveys over the years and what technologies would people like to use, passwords seem to top the list ahead of biometrics, tokens and other things that could be given to them. But often the reason for this happiness with passwords from the end user perspective is very often that they're not using them particularly correctly. Okay? So it's easy to understand the idea, it's familiar across different systems, but the fact is, if you were forcing people to abide by the, the good practice guidance, then actually I think they would find them far more difficult to use. So I say, um, pretty much everything you can do in terms of the good practice guidance, so enforcing the selection criteria that uh, I say, all the guidance will say about in terms of having a password of a decent length, making sure the character composition is more than just basic alphabetic characters, for example, making sure you change them regularly, not reusing them across multiple systems, not writing them down. All of this adds to the demands of passwords and ultimately serves to make them less usable. Okay, and particularly the need to, if we wanted to follow the good practice, the need to do so across multiple systems that we use makes it somewhat more challenging. So just for my reference, show of hands in the room, how many people follow all of this good practice for their passwords, first of all? And how many of you do it across all of the systems that you have passwords on? Now, for the benefit of any camera recordings, there are demonstrably fewer hands in response to the latter question. There was not a full house in response to even the first question about just using all of those bits of guidance. And so even for us, if you like, a security-related audience, it's actually quite difficult to follow this in terms of the, the, the usability that would result, and that's likely why we don't do it. So password management tools can help to some degree, but uh, then you've got the complication of actually having to get the passwords recovered from the password <coughs> management tool. So it puts a little bit of a further hurdle in the way of actually using the systems when you want to. Now, one of the things that I've looked at as a, a bit of individual research a couple of times over the years now is looking at how do the popular websites help the end users that they're encouraging to sign up and create accounts to actually choose and use good passwords on the sites themselves. So these are sites that millions of people use, and so the way in which these sites are helping people or not to learn the password-related lessons is likely to influence the practice of users more generally. So for example, okay, I was able to use this password for this site, so it should be good enough for use elsewhere. And indeed, other websites will look at some of the leading sites as perhaps examples of not necessarily good practice, but standard accepted practice for online authentication, and think if it's good enough for them, then it's good enough for us. And so most recently I did this uh, back towards the end of 2011, and looked at what were then um, 10 leading sites from the Alexa Top 500, and I've got the, the sites listed in a second. And what it serves to do is capture some of the, the most well-known leading brands, so there shouldn't be anything on there that uh, you're not familiar with. Just to, to illustrate the point about the, uh, the sign-ons to most of these sites, then, okay, password authentication is a fairly familiar thing that faces the online user. Now, some of the sites, so for example, Google, do let you go a bit further. You can sign up for two-step verification and have a one-time code that you can have generated on an app, can have texted to you, can even have on a, a list that you've printed off in advance. So just knowing the, path, the account password isn't sufficient there. But the default level for all of these sites is a standard user ID and password. So what I looked at as part of this was, well, what password practice enforcement did these sites actually make? So some of them would warn you about certain things, and some of them provided a level of guidance. Not all of them even provided guidance on selecting your password. But what rules did they actually enforce when you were choosing your password at initial sign-up? So the sites that I looked at, you can see them listed there, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, etc. And the restrictions I looked at were, well, was there a minimum length requirement? 
and in most, you might not be able to read it on the slide from a distance, so in most cases the minimum length was six characters, was uh, basically as much as they were looking for. Google was the best of the bunch looking for eight characters as a minimum. Uh, Wikipedia didn't need any minimum length, you could have a one character password on Wikipedia, and back a few couple of years before I did this one, when I looked at them, you could have also had a one character password on Amazon. They have luckily made it much stronger now by insisting on at least six. Um, also, I looked at, did the site allow you to use your surname as the password? And, uh, well, most of them didn't enforce the restriction there, so most of them allowed the surname uh, to be used. Most of them didn't restrict you, or some of them didn't restrict you from using your user ID as the password. So, you know, you could put SFNL in as your user ID, and then exactly the same thing as the password. Um, most of them did prevent you from using the word password as your password. Some users do have the tendency to do so, um, so the surveys tell us, and so quite useful to block that. And a couple of sites, Amazon and Wikipedia, again, didn't do that. Most of them didn't have any restriction against using dictionary words, um, so I used a few dictionary word examples, again, based on the fact that many users tend to utilize these because they're easier to remember, and most of the sites don't prevent you. Most of the sites didn't do anything to check the composition of the password to make sure you were using alphabetic and numeric and special symbols, for instance. And most of them, when it came to, uh, if you like, resetting your password, or if you did the forgotten password link, etc., most of them didn't prevent you from reusing an old choice, either perhaps not such a concern in the website context, but it's certainly a standard thing we would expect within organizations. And also had a look to see which ones had guidance in terms of a password meter. And again, it's a bit of a mixed picture there. Now this, of course, is reflecting September 2011, so it's a little while ago now, so not all of these findings will still hold true. They do tend to evolve. But, okay, 2011, problems with passwords were already quite widely known by that point, and so I would have personally expected better levels of enforcement of password practice as part of this process. What was quite notable was many of the sites did warn the, the user, so they, the password meter would, for example, say that's a weak password choice, but there was still no enforcement to make sure that they actually did follow the, the advice. Okay, so enforcement of password length was variable. Um, many other checks were often excluded, so I said they informed, but they didn't enforce. Um, now, so some sites might argue that the user's not storing very sensitive data on our site, so they wouldn't need to have a particularly strong password, etc. But actually, there are some arguments against this. So I say it overlooks the fact that users might, I say, learn a lesson from the site and think, okay, let's use the same password for other services where they might have something more sensitive to be protected. And as I say, also contributing to this wider security culture of getting users into better practices and also setting examples, given that these were leading sites that many, of course, would look to to set the standard, setting a better example for other sites on, online to follow. So looking at some, some wider research that we've done around passwords here at Plymouth, we, I mean, you'll find other surveys that will quite readily tell you the burden of passwords for many users. We found in a recent survey of 246 respondents that almost a third of them have got more, 16 or more password-based accounts that they have to deal with. So this isn't that they've got 16 more or more different passwords necessarily, but they've got 16 more accounts that are password controlled. Okay, so it's something that many people are encountering on a very regular basis and they've got quite a lot of them to manage. Now, asking those same respondents about their use of the passwords, and what we did in this particular set of questions was ask them, think about your most significant account, the account that's most important to you, has your most valuable information. What of the following practices apply to your use of the password on that account? So, did it have at least eight characters? Was it alphanumeric? Did it have other symbols? Is it a dictionary word? Is it based on personal information about you? These first five characteristics are all around the password selection. So I would say to have, wouldn't still necessarily say it's, got, it's going to necessarily be a great password, but to at least have a baseline good password to satisfy each of those criteria <coughs> would be quite useful. And then other things here were around what did they do with the password once they'd initially chosen it. So did they change it? Do they, uh, did they change it regularly? Have they changed it at all? Have they given it to other people and have they ever forgotten it? So you can see the results there, and some of them aren't particularly stunning. And one that's, on the, that's not on the slide, which I can also add, is 
the percentage of people that actually complied appropriately with the first five points around password selection was only about 25%. So only a quarter of the, the respondents in the survey had chosen a password that would tick all of those boxes, and therefore you could say it's a baseline reasonable choice. Okay, and that's for their most important account. So another thing that we did beyond that was had a look to see, okay, does providing password advice and guidance actually help? And something that we did, this is in conjunction with a research at the University, at Chemnitz University of Technology in Germany, created two versions of a website and they basically exposed this to you, a series of users and told them that the idea of it was to participate in a usability study of the website itself. <coughs> now, unbeknownst to them, one of the things that we were looking at here was the password behavior that they would exhibit. And what they were required to do, we had two versions of the site, one was the usable version, one was the less usable version. In both cases, they had to create a, pass a username and password to register their test, so to speak. Now, they weren't told it was a password assessment that was being done. That's not what they thought they were being monitored for. And the less usable version of the site um, basically didn't provide any password guidance. It basically let them choose whatever part, username and password they liked. The only thing they were asked to do was not to reuse a password that they were already using on other systems. The other version of the site had some guidance presented to the users. So it was telling them the things about a minimum length, it was telling them about character composition, etc. It wasn't enforcing any of this, so they could still choose whatever they liked, but the guidance was there visibly for them to see. Okay, so this was the, the uh, way we scored things. So did they have, so it's based on the, the five things from the previous table. So did, it, did their password choices comply appropriately with these five criteria? So what we see, so this is work in progress. Um, so we've only got 27 initial participants so far, so it's not statistically significant, but it is nonetheless interesting at this stage that for the unguided users, their average score was almost two out of five. So they weren't doing particularly well. Whereas the guided users, so those that just had on the screen some advice around choosing passwords a bit better, and also a password meter that was giving them some feedback, they got 3.8. So a tangible difference in the performance just by virtue of presenting the guidance visibly to them. Okay? And you can see there that there are some significant differences in, for example, their tendency to use alphanumeric passwords. Um, quite a lot of difference there in terms of whether they were guided or not. Um, to have the password length, only 50% of them did it without guidance, but 85% when they were guided to do so better. Okay, so even providing the guidance is a useful contribution. Now, of course, there are many sites that already go beyond the basic password. An example is online banking. So here just uh, is one from, I think it's ING Direct. So, okay, this is making it more involved. It's more difficult for users to reuse something <coughs> that they're using elsewhere. Uh, but this is a more involved process for the user as well. So you've got the demands of authentication here. You need a banking number. You need to know your surname. I suppose that's reasonable enough for most people to remember, but they've still got to enter the information. They've then got to have selected digits from their security number. Okay, so the, as it says there, the first, sixth, and third digits from their, their PIN. So note they're not being asked for them in sequential order. <coughs> note also that the keypad on the screen is not in the normal order you'd expect it. So it's to guard against sort of screen logging and things of that nature. But all of this, and they need to have a memorable date, which they also enter via this keypad. Now, all of this adds to the cognitive process that the user has to go through, and the, consequently, the amount of time it takes to complete the login. So by comparison to typing a password, which you might do within well, less than five seconds, this typically is going to take somebody maybe 20, 30, maybe a minute even, if they have to, to go and somewhere and look up what their banking number was and try and find work to think what the PIN was, etc. Okay, so I say, more time consuming, um, the user can't now rely on the reflex action that they might normally have of typing their password, and so it's, it's a much less automatic process. So while it's quite tolerable in some cases for the online banking context, because the user realizes the nature of the asset that they're looking to protect, their money, um, perhaps this wouldn't be quite so tolerable in the, the wider context of online authentication. Um, 
Another example that you might be familiar with is the uh, HSBC Secure Key. It's one example of the, the one-time code generation devices that many banks, certainly in the UK, are now issuing. So here, the process is, again, a bit more involved. The user needs to enter their banking ID on the website. They answer a security question on the website. Then they enter a PIN on this device, and it generates for them a one-time code. So again, it's an involved process multi-stages, and it also requires them to have the device to hand to be able to complete the process. Okay, so again, more complexity, um, but perhaps judged by some users to be appropriate to the, the, the value of the asset. Okay, so, might not object to the banking context, but would it work for authentication in general? Perhaps less tolerable. And even in the banking context, some users don't necessarily like it. So here's a, a tweet that I picked up at one point. I saw this and I thought it was worth recording. So, something you, Internet Banking, said this particular tweeter, your password would have uppercase letter, a number, a hair from the head of Jesus, <laughs> asparagus, a rainbow, and Yoda. Now, not all of these things are necessarily easy for the average user to get hold of, and certainly this, this gives you an indication of the, the complexity that this particular user felt the online banking system had actually got to. So another alternative, which might work in some contexts, is graphical authentication. This is a, an example from a few years ago now that uh, some of our project students have developed here at the university. We use this as a front end for logging into websites and also for mobile devices. And this one, just as an example, requires the user to remember a sequence of everyday objects in the right order. Uh, normally in use it wouldn't be highlighting the choices that the user's made, it's just an <laughs> illustration. Um, and I said, we've done it on a couple of platforms. Now, the idea of graphically oriented mechanisms is now gaining a bit of ground. I don't know whether anyone's used Windows 8's picture password. Show of hands if you have. Okay, so a couple of people have done so. So what this introduces, and it's potentially quite suited to the touch devices that Windows 8 can run on, is the idea you've got a picture, and then you've got some secret points and associated gestures within it. So three types of gesture. You can have just selecting a point, you can have drawing a line between two points, and you can have drawing a circle around certain areas. And they don't have to be um, particularly confined. You can have a bigger circle, you have longer lines, etc. And it relies upon the user recognizing the picture and then remembering the secret regions that they've nominated within it. So three, three secrets they have to store, remembering the, the locations in the picture and whether it was a touch or a tap, a line or a circle that they're actually meant to be dealing with. So potentially quite friendly um, from the perspective of the touch devices and not something that is in widespread use elsewhere at the moment, so not something where the user would be able to reuse their existing secret on the device. But it is nonetheless underpinned by the password still as the master authentication key which, if you've forgotten your picture password, which I actually did the first time I set one up, just to play with it, and then went back to the device, and oh dear, I can't actually remember what the gestures were, you can use your password to unlock it. So actually, potentially, what you could argue this is doing is introducing now two points of failure. Somebody could compromise the picture password or the normal password on the device. Uh, Android Pattern Lock, anybody familiar with that? I would imagine this is going to be a bit more uh, known to people. So, okay. Clearly, again, suited to touch devices. Many Android users think this is really good. Um, complex patterns are possible, but perhaps harder to remember. They're certainly more observable than pins. Even if you've got somebody holding an Android device up and you can't see the screen, looking at the way their fingers move, actually, you could say, okay, they must have started in the bottom corner and have gone sort of like that. And it is quite an observable technique. And also the fact that you can leave greasy finger marks all over the screen and somebody can look at it in the light, that's another clue. In fact, the first time I encountered this, um, I was out with some students and uh, one of the students had got his phone locked with the, uh, the pattern lock and he went off, I don't know if it's to the bar or to the toilet, but anyway, he left the phone on the table knowing it's nice and secure and one of his friends picked it up, looked at it in the light, undid the pattern lock on the phone because he could see the marks where they'd been left from previous uses and we nicely changed the pattern lock for him so that when he came back <laughs> he couldn't actually unlock his own phone. Um, so. Okay, third option, so we've had, we've got, had secrets, we've had tokens and now the, the other option of course was mentioned in uh, Paul's talk previously, the use of biometrics. Um, authenticating you based on something that you are as a person, something physiological or something behavioural. 
quite nice potentially from a usability perspective in the sense there's nothing to remember, nothing for you to lose or to leave behind, but it still doesn't mean it's a, a, an infallible perfect technique. Okay, so there are plenty of practical factors that can make this a bit of a nuisance. So failure to acquire a sample in the first place, the fact that some people have difficulty with some of the biometric techniques. The, the potential of false rejection, so the device telling you, despite your best attempts to prove that you are, the device telling you you're not you. And, and these things and other potential limitations may make it well, I say, less tolerable from the legitimate user perspective. So an example, again using Android, something that was introduced last year, I think, is the facial unlock. And we've got an example here of this in use. And so here, you hold the phone up, it recognizes your face, and then it's meant to unlock with the production of the appropriate face in front of it. But the original implementation of this was not overly secure. You could hold up a picture of the legitimate user, and the phone would unlock for that. And in actual fact, this still here is taken from a video that we've got on iTunes U, which is actually showing my colleague Nathan Clark um, holding up his iPhone to his Android device with the iPhone having a picture of him on the screen and the Android device saying, oh, that looks like you, I'll unlock for you. Um, more recently, they, they've improved the technique. It now has liveness detection built in, so it's looking for eye movements of the subject. But I think that's also been shown to be fallible by having a picture of the, the legitimate user held up with eye holes cut in it and then blinking behind it. <laughs> okay? Uh, so, again, it attempts to improve the usability, but at this level, at least, it's not infallible. Okay, but certainly what we do believe in, and this is drawing again upon some research here at Plymouth, is the idea of making authentication less intrusive, so placing less demands on the user. So here's an example of a device that we did some project work on a couple of years ago now. And what we incorporated into this was signature or gesture verification on the touch screen, voice verification via the microphone, which is down there, um, keystroke dynamics on the keypad, facial recognition through the camera, and general behavioral profiling, looking at what the user was using on the device. The idea being with various different feeds available, several of them biometrically related, we could draw upon different things at different times to suit what the user was doing without having to explicitly interrupt them wherever possible to authenticate themselves. Notice the device has a fingerprint reader on it, but we didn't want to utilize that because that required a specific security interaction that would have served no other purpose. Okay, so to conclude then, I mean, I'm not saying any of these things are the, the right solution or the perfect solution. Certainly there are many problems with passwords, not only the way that users use them, but also the way that service providers present them and encourage them to be used. But there are differences in terms of the mental effort, the convenience, the applicability to different types of device. So those graphical methods and those biometric methods aren't universally applicable to all devices. So with the graphical methods, with the touch methods, you need a touch screen, you need a graphical display. And that, in many cases, explains the ongoing prominence of passwords, actually, because they're pretty low rent in terms of their requirements to run on different types of system and device. And uh, it's also worth considering the flexibility, the ease with which the user can actually change something if a compromise occurs or if they, if they wish to update their, their credential. Quite easy with passwords, reasonably possible with tokens, less easy with biometrics when it actually relates to a characteristic of who you are. With that, my contact details. So thank you very much.